Hi, this is Brian Kim. I want to share with you in this video how to do the Amani technique with a Sensar IOL. I have heard many surgeons saying they had difficulty getting a hold of the CT Lucia 602 lens for the Yamani technique. In the United States, it's the only one that has polyvanillidine fluoride haptics, which is the haptics that are very strong and durable. Any other lens that we have access to has haptics made of PMMA, which break very easily when you try to manipulate the haptics. And so I'm going to show you my modified Yamani technique and how I'm able to avoid damaging the haptics and successfully executing the Yamani technique with these modifications and being able to use this with the Sensar IOL. And so if you don't have the CT Lucia 602 lens, you can still do the technique with a Sensar IOL. So pearl number one, precise conjunctival marks are crucial, otherwise you can have poor scleral needle placement, which can lead to poor IOL position or IOL to iris contact. It doesn't make any sense when you do the difficult maneuvers and you finally pass the haptics through the needle and then you put it into place, you cauterize the ends and the lens is tilted, decentered, or it's rubbing against the iris and causing UGG syndrome. So this is the case you can see this patient has a dislocated lens. I'm marking the limbus. I like to use the tip of the cannula marked and then I'm using the cannula itself to find 180 degrees apart. You can see I use a cotton tip to steady my hand as I do this. I like to dry the surface with the cotton tip, which gives me a more precise mark. I'm using the caliper to mark two and a half millimeters posterior to the limbus on either side, making sure it's in radial fashion. And then very carefully, I'm gonna mark two and a half millimeters posterior and then two millimeters adjacent. So number two, when placing the needle two and a half millimeters posterior to the limbus, I choose an IOL target of a minus one diopter for a planar result. And so because I like to go two and a half millimeters back, you have to make this refractive adjustment. Why do I go two and a half millimeters back? Because in my experience, this reduces the chances for IOL to iris contact. This reduces the risk for UGG syndrome, reduces the risk for optic capture as well. Going ahead and mark on the other side, two and a half millimeters posterior to the limbus, and then two millimeters adjacent. I'm using the cotton tip to turn the eye and I'm indenting with the trocar, four millimeters posterior to the limbus. I'm going to stab with the trocar tangentially, tunneling about two to three millimeters and then entering. I'm making my paracentesis incisions. This is the incision for my AC maintainer. I'm injecting some dispersive viscoelastic to coat the cornea. And then I'm using the Maltzman here to retract the pupil edge to see how much capsular support I have. I saw no capsule on the left side and here on the right side, I do see a little bit of peripheral capsule. And I'm actually amazed that this lens is actually in position. This patient had surgery decades ago and I don't know how this surgeon magically placed this lens because I don't see any capsule. So I'm going ahead and placing the 20 gauge AC maintainer. I'm making my incision super temporal. This is a three millimeter keratome incision. I'm using the cannula to hold the eye. And then once I make my main incision, I make my contra-incisional incision. And that's important because you want them to be 180 degrees apart. With a 200 microforcep technique, I grasp the lens with the haptic, prolapse it up into the anterior chamber. And now I'm going to grasp the IOL optic with the right hand and then using the forceps in the other hand to slide and sweep up the haptic on the left side. You see the left hand slips off the optic, which tells you this is a silicone lens. My right hand has a serrated forceps and that's the only one that's gonna be able to hold the optic at all here. So I have to grasp the haptic with the left hand and I was able to carefully sweep the iris so the haptic came up on both sides now. I'm using the serrated IOL 
holder on the left hand and I'm going to go ahead and cut and bisect the lens in half here with the scissor in my right hand and it cuts quite easily here. Again, because this is a silicone lens, I have to use the serrated teeth forceps to be able to extract each piece. So I switch hands and I place the serrated forceps in the right hand. And I'm able to pull that piece out. And then grasping the other piece in a similar manner and pulling it up. It got stuck there. Grab it again, and then it pops out. I go ahead and do my vitrectomy. It's important to do a thorough anterior vitrectomy because you'll be manipulating the lens in that space. You don't want the vitreous to be tethered in the lens and the haptics. And so I go to 3x speed here just for time's sake. You can see I'm using with the left hand a cannula to sweep the main incision. There's just a little bit of vitreous to the wound. And so I'm going to do a thorough vitrectomy. Interestingly enough, in these cases with lens dislocation, I've noticed there's not a significant amount of vitreous in the anterior vitreous space. Number three, you want to bend the needles so the bevel faces the approach of the haptic in order to dock the haptic more easily into the needle. And this is very important because as you're bending the needle, you have to be strategic because once you place the needle into the sclera and you're all ready to go, if the bevel is facing the wrong way, you basically have to start all over. And so for the right needle, I like to bend it about nine millimeters from the tip, about 70 to 80 degrees. And I'm gonna simulate how I'm gonna hold it in the eye like this. And you can see the bevel is facing towards me. So the right needle faces towards me. The left needle I'm bending at the hub and it's gonna face away from me. In both cases, it's going to face towards the approach of the haptic. And those incisions are so that I can place iris hooks to better visualize when I place the haptic into the needle. Now, this is the vitrector assisted PI. This is 30 cuts per minute fixed. Aspiration is 0 to 12 linear control, and vacuum is 0 to 350 linear control. Number four. This is a trailing haptic first modification. You want to externalize a leading haptic through a contralateral limbal incision to more easily access the trailing haptic and more easily manipulate the trailing haptic for scleral needle fixation. And so this is very important. As you externalize a leading haptic with this delicate PMMA haptics on the sensor lens or a technus lens, it's very careful you don't crush the tip of the haptic otherwise it will be difficult to cannulate through the needle you have to be very careful as you externalize that haptic so i'm, I'm going ahead and placing the lens injector into the eye I have the bevel pointed to the left. I place the micro forceps through the contralateral limbal incision. As my assistant starts to deliver the leading haptic, I ask her to stop and then I grasp the tip and I very carefully, as she advances the lens, I deliver the leading haptic out through the contralateral limbal incision. At this point, I take over and I start to deliver the optic and then I sweep the trailing haptic towards the right here. Again, I cannot reiterate enough that you cannot damage the haptic as you externalize it. I inject some dispersive viscoelastic to push the lens away from the corneal endothelium. And this is number five. You want to stabilize the eye in the neutral position to ensure the conjunctival marks align with the intended scleral needle placement. In the past, I, I wasn't aware of the conjunctival marks being mobile because the conjunctiva is loose tissue. As you're manipulating it, it'll start to distort and move. And so your intended marks are not necessarily where they were. You want it to be two and a half millimeters posterior and two millimeters adjacent. And because the tissue can stretch and move, it might not reflect that. So it's important to hold the eye in the neutral position. So I'm using 0.12 forceps, holding the trocar, holding the eye in the neutral position. I'm stabbing the first mark 
with the needle at an angle. I'm entering and tunneling two millimeters and then diving in. And you want to make sure the needle is in the pupillary zone. Number six, you want to dock the haptic on the bevel of the needle and then straighten it and align the haptic with the needle for more efficient and controlled cannulation. If you don't do this right, you're going to damage the haptic. And the beauty of this technique is because of externalizing the leading haptic, you can access the trailing haptic so much more easily and you're not having to fight any forces from the left haptic tether to the needle on the left side. Because we haven't done that one yet, you can do the trailing haptic with a lot less difficulty. And you'll see that here. So I'm placing the forceps through the main incision, grasping the haptic, and I'm grasping it actually fairly far away from the tip, which is good because if you grasp the tip, you can damage the tip. The bevel is facing towards the haptic. I'm gonna dock the haptic on the bevel of the needle, and then I'm very carefully threading it and cannulating the haptic into the needle. And that was it. Again, this is a 30 gauge thin wall needle and it's able to accommodate that PMMA haptic. But again, if you don't direct it carefully, you can push and then break or kink the haptic. And if you do that, you'll have to explant the lens because the haptic is damaged and then it might break. So I disengage the syringe from the needle using a hemostat. I internalize the leading haptic and place it into the angle. And this is number seven. In this case, the pupil has come down. If visualization is poor to cannulate the haptic into the needle, you have to find a way to improve visibility. And so in this case, you saw I pre-placed some incisions and I'm gonna place the iris retractor, two iris retractors in order to retract the pupil and I'm going to be able to cannulate the leading haptic so much more easily because I've improved my visualization. I don't like to use a ring because if you use a ring and if it slips, it might dislocate into the vitreous space. With iris hooks, you don't have that concern. So again, I pre-placed those incisions and placing the iris hook in. I'm hooking the edge of the iris there, and then I'll retract the pupil. And I'm only retracting in that area because that's going to be where the leading haptic is when I try to cannulate the left side needle. So I'm grabbing the main incision to hold the eye in the neutral position. I'm placing the left side needle at that first mark. I'm tunneling two millimeters and then diving in. I rotate the needle so I can see it. Again, because I've retracted the iris with the hooks, my visibility is really, really nice here. I'm able to grasp the haptic and see I'm trying to grasp it a little bit more distal. And look here, this is interesting. See how acute of an angle there is here. But look, because I dock it on the bevel, it straightens it, flattens it out, and then now it's secure. So I can grasp it, flatten it out, make sure it's parallel to the needle, and I can very carefully cannulate the needle with the haptic. And once I'm ready to go, I go ahead and pull the needle out and the haptic comes out. I grasp it with the forceps and then I quickly cauterize the tip. And I do the same thing on the other side. And this is very important. Pay attention to how much tension there is on the left side haptic optic junction. You wanna keep pushing that haptic in. You don't want that haptic to come out too much as the right side needle is coming out. Otherwise it creates even more tension. You cauterize the tips, and that is the end of my modified Yamani technique. You can see that the lens is well centered. I'm taking out each of the iris hooks here. Now I'm switching to cortex mode, and I'm able to remove the viscoelastic from the anterior chamber. And number eight, you can inject intracameral triamcinolone after you move the viscoelastic from the anterior chamber to ensure there's no vitreous in the anterior chamber. And so you can certainly use myocol, constricted pupil, but triamcinolone gives you direct visualization of the vitreous, and plus the triamcinolone also helps with controlling inflammation 
And so we're going to go ahead and inject some intracameral triamcinolone. And then using the vitrector, we're going to do the anterior vitrectomy. You can see there's absolutely no vitreous in the anterior chamber. And then I do some more vitrectomy in the posterior segment. Whenever I do these cases, I always place a single tenonolin suture through the main wound because you just never know and I don't want to see any vitreous coming to the wound or any strands. So I go ahead and place the suture, bury the knot, and I go ahead and hydrate my incisions. So remember, you have to make sure that your scleral needle placement is correct and that means that the conjunctiva needs to be immobilized so that the conjunctival mark truly reflects the intended scleral needle placement. I place the needle two and a half millimeters posterior to the limbus. I choose a minus one diopter power target. I do the trailing haptic first modification, which allows me to easily access the trailing haptic without any significant manipulation of the haptic as I'm trying to cannulate the needle. This is the biggest problem with the technique and why surgeons get into trouble. Again, with the CT Lucia lens, you can beat up those haptics and you're gonna be fine. You cannot get away with that if you're gonna use a non-CT Lucia lens. If you have a lens that has PMMA haptics, if you beat up the haptics, you will break the haptics, damage the haptics. And you're not gonna to wanna to use that lens because then it might be damaged and it won't be stable. At the end of the case, I hydrate my incisions. I take the trocar out. I take the AC maintainer out and I inject subconjunctival ANSEF at the end of all of my vitrectomy cases. This patient did quite well, pulsed up one week. The patient was 2025, uncorrected. The manifest refraction was minus one plus 0.75 at 120, and the patient was correctable to 2020 vision. So I hope this was helpful to you, and I thank you for your attention.